<laughs> and it's fun because I work at Warner Brothers, so sometimes yeah. we'll see the the contestants and the bachelor like walking around the lot. So it's always fun to to run into them. Let's talk about post production. Do you know what post production is? Post production would be I think production is like principal photography and then post production would just be like editing and and not special effects but like computer effects and like music and stitching it all together. You're I dead think. on. I think a lot of people are confused, myself included, as to like, what's the scope of post-production? What does it actually mean? So I reached out to Emily Hall, who I connected with from like a filmmaking group, and we talked about what does post-production look like? What's a coordinator do versus a manager? How early in a project are they involved versus how late? She recently worked on some recent seasons of You with our boy Penn Badgley on Netflix and Taika Waititi's Our Flag Means Death. So it's nice. She breaks it all down for us and gets into what she enjoys about it and why she got started in the first place. Well, that's cool. I'll be interested to hear what a post-production coordinator actually does. And after the interview, catch up on what we've been seeing in theaters and at home. Emily Eldridge Hall, welcome to the Indie Magazine podcast. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Yeah, thanks for coming on today. And for everyone listening, what is your current job title or role? I'm a post-production coordinator and supervisor, and I work in scripted television. And are you based here in LA or elsewhere? Yes. I've been in Los Angeles for five years, and yeah, this is I work in Hollywood. It's been really exciting. That's awesome. And did you grow up here? Did you move here recently? I moved here... 2019, after graduating college, I actually grew up in D.C. I went to school there, too, at American University. So I have, yeah, I've spent most time on the East Coast, born in China, but um, I call L.A. my home. I love it. That's awesome. Yeah, it's not a better place to call home after a little while, right? Definitely. Did you grow up knowing you always want to get into entertainment, or is it something you discovered a little later? I actually always wanted to be in entertainment when I was... In elementary school, I wanted to be an actress or a singer, and things evolved. I learned more about the crew side. Uh, I went to a summer camp. It was an arts camp in D.C. where they had a class called Hollywood Film Crew. And you had to be in fourth grade to take that course, but I did do that, and I fell in love with it. I was able to do filming and writing, acting for it, basically touching all parts of the process. And then my instructors let me edit some of the, the videos that we made. And so that's when I really got into it. And then just from there on, I was editing my own music videos with friends. I had kind of dabbled between wanting to be a cinematographer or an editor. And I eventually chose editing and then learned about post-production. So I love post-production and this is where I decided to stay. Yeah, that's a great path. And through through a summer camp, (laughs) that's awesome. Now, I guess you said you had gone to a, what was the university in DC? American University? Yes. Did you study film and and editing and post-production there, or were you doing something more traditional? Yes, that school is very holistic, so they don't have an actual concentration option. But because I was learning writing, directing, editing, all of it, I then decided that I wanted to edit most of my friend's projects. So by kind of creating my own concentration, I was able to show to internships uh, that that's what I wanted to do. And they were kind of able to see that I had experience in that and uh, hire me for internship programs. That's great. And so I guess when you said you, you went from the summer camp to doing some things before college, what were you, were you on Adobe or how did you first kind of get started editing? Well, when I first started, it was Windows Movie Maker and oh, yeah. Sony Vegas, so the <laughs> the big ones back in the day. But then we, when we got a little bit more into the professional side of things, I was using Adobe. That's what they taught us in school. But then coming out here to LA, I learned that everyone uses Avid. And that was the unfortunate thing was that I never learned Avid in school. And mm-hmm. I wish that I had had that because I think that would have really elevated anyone who wants to be in the industry in editing ability to be hired. But yeah, I kind of touched on Avid a bit. I got to use some of the programs out here when I was working on shows, but eventually I I still sometimes edit videos for commercial companies or social media companies where all of those use Adobe. 
So it's nice to still be able to use what I know for that, but I never got really into Avid. So yeah, that's also some software that in the future I could learn. Yeah. And what 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 got you first interested in post-production? You said some of the early jobs you took, or just did you find it was a little more in line with your skill set? Yeah. In a, my first internship out here in LA was right after college. It was with the Television Academy Emmys program. So they had placed me at two television shows at Fox 21 Studios at the time. So on Queen of the South, which was the first scripted television show I worked on, I saw what the post PA did, the coordinator, the post producer, and it was never a side that I learned in school. So getting to see a whole different part of the industry in post-production was really exciting to me. I learned that there was a whole managerial and admin side where I could delegate or work on the process and the organization side of things more so than it's still creative, but it's not the kind of creativity that I really enjoy having every day where with editing, you're getting notes and you're at the computer all day working in the software. And I learned over time that I really wanted to be more that outward facing side of things where I'm the liaison between the studio and the network. So I learned that through my internship and then my first post PA job with Showtime, I got to learn more from my coordinator and I realized that was my, my path that I wanted. Yeah, that's great that you got to experience a little bit before kind of going the entire, you know, making that entire choice, even though your experience beforehand maybe had been a little bit different and you had some other ideas. Do you feel like now knowing this, you have a clear path of where you want to go in five and 10 years, or is it still a little up in the air? I definitely have a clear path um, where I know that uh, I want to be a post producer and Mm -hmm. work show side. Um, That could be multiple years multiple shows, and then eventually move studio side. I would love to be a post-production manager or executive if an opening comes up, but that would be a long time in the future. I love working show side because it's really hands-on. You're really in the process. I think studio side is really great if you want that stability, if you're starting a family. But right now, I love the excitement of working show side and switching shows every year. Yeah. Yeah. Have you felt, I mean, you're you're obviously doing television. You've done it since you came here originally. Have you felt the pull to do film at all, or do you do you prefer the TV side? That's a great question. I actually I know so many people want to move to film, and film yeah. is still kind of known as that like goal for people in the industry. But TV is where I really fell in love. I because I had applied to Academy Gold, which is an internship program out here with uh, the Oscars film people. And then uh, I also applied to the Emmys one and I got into the Emmys one. So that really set my path towards television. So having that opening into TV was really great. And then just me having been in TV for five years, I have learned how exciting it is. And I watch TV a lot more than film. It's so funny. Like whenever someone asks if I've seen a movie, I normally haven't, which I guess is a little bit weird being someone who studied film, but Yeah, I just, I watch TV all the time, like, try to catch my shows every week. I'm probably watching, like, 10 TV shows a week. That's great. And good to have that understanding and knowledge and kind of switching to what you enjoy more so than what other people may perceive as being, yeah, like you said, like an end goal for some or otherwise. I know a lot of people we've interviewed on here recently have talked about this is the era of prestige television where TV shows are running with the budgets or the look of movies. So there's such a, it's a smaller difference than it was, I think 20, 30 years ago. Definitely. Definitely. And I've, I've gotten the opportunity to work on a lot of mainly streaming shows. So working with Showtime, HBO, Apple, and Netflix, it already feels like we're working on this high budget, almost movie like thing. Yeah. What, just for everyone listening, what is a a normal day or an average day as a post-production coordinator look like? Um, It really depends day to day and what my team needs. But the biggest thing that I do is send cuts to the studio and the network and schedule ADR sessions. So we're doing re-recording sessions with actors for anything that didn't get picked up or didn't work on set. That is that takes most of my time, which is super exciting because I'm connecting with agents and managers around the world and then getting studios available and booked for our actors to come in. So like on Our Flag Means Death, when I worked on that show, I booked Taika Waititi in uh, Sydney, Australia. Like, it's wow. really exciting getting to work across the world with some actors 
or going into the studio and getting to meet them in person while they record at Warner Brothers. So that's a big part of my job. I draft the credits, so I make sure that everyone is built in correct order and time them out so that they're on screen for the right amount of time. I am sending emails between the studio and the network, checking on clearance issues, updating the visual effects tracker and helping clear visual effects as well. And sometimes I sit in online sessions, color sessions. So just the whole process, kind of making sure that things are in order, making sure people are staying on schedule. So things like that. Yeah, a lot of organization, it sounds like. And it sounds, at least from my perspective, sounds fun that you get to touch so many aspects of a project coming to life from, you know, like you said, color or coordination or ADR. When do you, when are you first assigned on a project? Is it when it's uh, been announced or after it's been filmed? When do you kind of step into that process? Yeah, we actually step in super early. So right about two weeks before we start filming a show, okay. we are on there. So I actually think that post-production is one of the longest teams in the process. So yeah. Yeah, we're there through all of production and then maybe six months past production. So I'm normally on a show for about a year. That's great. Because I feel like, yeah, a lot of people on set will be there. You know, the sound guys, the cinematographers, they'll be there for a little bit before, do the shoot, send off their material. I mean, it makes sense, too, because there are so many things that I think that the post team has to really look at and make sure that we've got all the footage that we didn't shoot a visual effects plate weirdly. So just making sure that we have someone on the grounds on set is always important. We're watching the dailies every day as they come in, in case we need pickups or something. Who do you interact with the most in in your role? I know other people in post-production, but are you talking to the director or the producers or ADs, people like that? Yeah, I'm talking to all of them and it really depends on the circumstance. But for example, I would talk to the ADs or the second ADs when we are booking directors to come in for their sessions. Sometimes they are in a hotel or a a home somewhere where I need to book a car for them. So we get Transpo involved. Um, I am always emailing with the producers, making sure that they have the cuts and that we get their notes back. But because the, the process of an episode it goes from the editor's cut directors producers studio and the network i'm really talking to each of them because i'm the one sending the the emails and the notices out to all of them that's great yeah and you again getting to rub shoulders and work with all kinds of people is there you mentioned taika waititi already are there other people who have stuck out to you for their professionalism or their organization or how they do things for sure i actually feel that a lot of everyone that i've worked with has been so nice and that has been really exciting because I think sometimes people don't have the best experiences with people in the industry, but it's been great to see that big actors, we work with Penn Badgley on you and that show, he has such a fun time doing that show and he's just such a nice person in general. So getting to book his ADR sessions and have him come in and just be excited to do all the VO, which is so much VO if anyone has seen you. And um, other people, there some directors, they're super nice. Editors, which I know a lot of people don't know editors as well, but editors are like the nicest people ever. So yeah, there's just been really great people. Yeah, my current show is called Bad Monkey. It'll be on Apple TV. And that show, it's with the Ted Lasso team. So all the producers who produce Ted Lasso are the nicest people ever. And it's been so exciting working with them. That's fun. Yeah, I didn't realize they were doing something after shrinking. So yeah. Bad Monkey coming to Apple TV Plus soon. Mm -hmm. As far as your goal of, yeah, five or 10 years down the road... I know you talked about kind of post-production, producer. Do you see yourself ever going on to the director side or do you prefer where you are now? It's interesting. My post-producer right now actually is on the director route. And I think that okay. is something that a lot of producers can end up wanting to do. But for me, I, I don't see myself directing and I've never been much of a writer. So I kind yeah. of wrote those things out. <laughs> but something that I do really enjoy doing that I do on the side is background acting. So I don't think I would actually do principal acting, but I do really enjoy just getting that opportunity to be on set and see how everyone on set works. Because when you're in post, you're not always there on the ground. So being in the action is exciting as well. That's fun. Yeah. And must give you a little different mindset when it comes to the the post side and exactly. getting to be on set. Yeah. As far as for those who are interested in 
becoming a post-production coordinator or just learning more about the position, if they don't get an internship, maybe like you did, what do you think is the best way for someone else to get into a role like that through networking or just cold applying or getting some skills? For sure. So I actually did a program with Warner Brothers Discovery it, and originally with HBO Max. And they it's a post-coordinator training program. And they also have one for oh, post-supervisors. Nice. And by applying to that program, you don't have to be in school. So it's not like an internship. And it is a paid program. It's a great way to get your foot in the door. You are working with sample, like actual HBO shows, but you're working with them as if they... So they're they're already streaming shows, but we get to take kind of their process and learn from it. And then kind of like pretend that you are the post coordinator on that show. Um, So by doing that, you are learning the entire process of how a high end streaming program um, is made uh, on the post side. You're also networking with people at HBO and other companies um, and you're getting your network of your instructor and your other fellow classmates so that when you go on into the industry, we're we still always pass each other's resumes along. We We'll hear about job opportunities and make sure that we can help get our friends hired who have also taken the course with us. So that's a great way to get in the industry is by finding training programs. Also, networking, of course, is the biggest way to get seen in the industry. It can definitely be tough to get your foot in the door if you don't have an internship or a fellowship type of opportunity. But um, Facebook groups are great to finding other people who work out here who may want to give you an informational interview or just talk with you and learning about working out here. Yeah, I actually found my my job on U Season 4 through a Facebook group that put out a notice oh, looking wow. for post coordinator. So by doing that and they wanted someone with Warner Bros. experience and because I had that, that was helpful. But a lot of my jobs are actually through word of mouth. So because I worked yeah. on a show with one team, they then wanted to hire me on another team. That's great. And I mean, definitely a push to always do your best job and be personable. And, you know, like you're saying, always networking because you never know where it's going to lead. Mm-hmm. I guess I had a question as you as an Asian woman in the industry, are there groups or organizations you're finding that pair you with other people and so you can kind of see others from similar backgrounds or similar stories and how they've kind of moved ahead in the industry at all? For sure. That's such an important question because, yeah, being an Asian woman in the industry has has been an amazing time, but yeah. it is very interesting not seeing that it's still a very white industry. So finding those communities in there is really helpful. I just joined the Producers Guild and they have an Asian American Pacific Islander group there. So you, oh, you can get... Great kind of that support system through that. And then uh, a lot of the programs that I've done, so the Television Academy's internship program and the Warner Bros. training program for post coordinators, we're both looking for people in underrepresented communities. So it's always nice to see these initiatives happening. There was Array Crew, which was Ava DuVernay's, but now it's Impact Mm -hmm. Crew. And so they were trying to get people who were underrepresented as well in the industry. So I think there's so many... Of course, there can be more, but there's already a lot of programs happening out there. And so anywhere you can find those is so, so helpful. Yeah, I remember when I first got here to L.A. 2018, I through this magazine cover an Asian American Pacific Islander film festival over down in downtown L.A. And just seeing and getting to meet some of the people and hearing about some of the unique struggles, I don't think I had fully realized some of the issues or or stories that weren't getting pushed forward. And I think in the last few years between, you know, Star Wars and otherwise, we've heard <laughs> there's just been a little more, I won't say frustration, but the barriers have been more clear that it's not just women or it's not just African-Americans. There still are all these issues. And I hope, like with the Oscars, adding more people to the Academy, we get a little more there, but it still seems to be a little bit of a of a struggle, right? Yeah, definitely. And it's also been so exciting seeing how much content has been being made in the Asian community or from the Asian community. I mean, Beef has won a bunch of awards this season. We had Past Lives, which is now one of my favorite movies. I wish it won more awards. And, you know, Parasite, there's everything ever all at once. So seeing that coming out and seeing them have so much publicity is so great. But also behind the scenes, it would be awesome to see more people 
like me in those positions. Definitely. And I hope there are more opportunities in there. It moves a little closer that way. I know it always feels like it's at a snail's pace every time we talk to somebody and they're like, oh, no, <laughs> still yeah. mostly male, still mostly white, still mostly family members. OK, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> hopefully tough. soon. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of stories or what, what movies you've already mentioned a few you like? What have you seen recently that you really liked in the theaters or, or like you're talking about TV? What TV shows do you think have pushed a boundary or done something that's really interesting to you? Yeah, well, one of my all-time favorite, it's not a new show, but This Is Us. That's my favorite TV show. I think it's really unique in that it they cast people, the same character, but different ages. And their jumping story lines and timelines. I was also adopted, so they have an adoption storyline. I think yeah. that is really great to have represented as well. So that is my all-time favorite show. But I also, I'm a huge NBC fan, and that's an NBC show. So I love yeah. Superstore, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, uh, The Good yeah. Place. Uh, those are all classics just to put on, and they're so funny. I love Abbott Elementary right now. Oh, it's great, and, yeah. Yeah, so good. I don't know, there's so many great shows and still so many shows I need to see as well. Um, and then for movies, I'm a huge coming-of-age fan. Mm -hmm. So movies like Boyhood, um, The Perks of Being a Wallflower, yeah. Lady Bird, those are all really amazing because um, I think everyone can relate to them in some way. Yeah, and there's a certain honesty there that's kind of refreshing, not just refreshing, but something like you're saying, we can all relate to, we can all connect to. Exactly. And this is actually the first award season where I've watched so many more films than I have in the past. So yeah. actually every movie that I watched this year really impressed me. So it was really yeah. cool to see that some great films are being nominated. Yeah, I loved American Fiction and, of course, Past Lives and The Holdovers was my favorite besides past lives. Those were great. Holdovers was great. Yeah. It really <laughs> snuck up on you too. I was like, oh, a boy's exactly. school, Paul Giamatti. But no, that was a really good one. Yeah. And Divine Joy Randolph. Thank heaven she got the Oscar. But I know. It was so, so, so exciting. Good. Yeah. What are you excited for in the next little bit? What kind of stories or what what do you hope to see on screen that would be really exciting to you? Yeah, I, I have some friends who are working on some shows that I'm really excited to come out. And one of them is Taika's new show, Interior Chinatown, because that will also touch on some Asian storylines. And some that just came out, my other friend just worked on Three Body Problem on Netflix. Oh, yeah. So that show also has an Asian storyline. So those, I think, are going to be really exciting to watch. I'm excited for Shrinking Season 2, which is being yeah. worked on right now. Yeah, I, I mean, I love television, so pretty much anything that comes out. I'm also... Because of the strikes, there has been a lag in things coming out. So it's been a little bit sad for me right now because there hasn't been as much to watch. Yeah. But things are slowly coming out. So I'm very excited for the, the near future. Yeah, slowly getting there, slowly getting there. Yeah. I was going to say, when when you go to check out, do you ever turn to reality TV? Or do you find that you're not ever bored with TV even though you're working in it? Yeah, I, I actually started watching reality during the pandemic. So... Uh -huh. I think that was something that a lot of people turn to. I was, I watched Selling Sunset and oh, yeah. Love is Blind, of course, is huge. I just finished the most recent season. And I think those are fun just to have on. And they're also a really interesting look on psychology and the way people view life and love. So yeah, Love is Blind, The Bachelor. This is the first season I've watched, but uh, I'm really into it this season as well. Yeah, finale. I know this will come out later, but the finale is on Monday, right? So Yeah, and it's fun because I work at Warner Brothers, so sometimes yeah. we'll see the the contestants and The Bachelor like walking around the lot. So it's always fun to, to run into them. That's really fun. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess last thing before we hop off, if someone wants to see your work, I know they can go to IMDb. Do you have a website? Do you prefer they follow you on Instagram? How does someone get in contact with you if they have questions about post-production or want to talk about getting you on the next show? Yeah. So I, I use my LinkedIn a lot. My LinkedIn is Emily Eldridge Hall and there it has all my information, but I'm always happy to talk to people. If you send out a message um, wanting to learn more about the industry or my work, yeah. Reaching out that way. My Instagram is also Emily Eldridge Hall. So, or it's actually music to my ears five, but my actual, well, you can find me with my name, so, yeah, um, my email is also emilyeldridgehall at gmail.com. Happy again to talk to anyone about working in the industry. 
Perfect. Well, yeah, thanks again for coming on and definitely keep us in the loop as other shows are coming out or if you've got some stories to share before the next season of you or Bad Monkey, yes. Bad Monkey on Apple TV Plus. We'll yes. have to have you back on. Thank you so much. Yeah, our I'll be working on you season five very shortly. So that'll be coming out in the near future as well. That's exciting. Well, congrats again on on continuing to get good work and working on good shows and with good people. And uh, yeah, thanks again for coming on today. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. All right. So you were sick. You watched a lot of stuff. Let's yeah, talk about what you watched. I watched Angels and Demons. Oh, yeah. I watched Sahara with Matthew McConaughey and Last Steve Zahn. Thing. I watched Star Wars The Force Awakens and Star Wars The Last Jedi. And then I couldn't finish the trilogy. I couldn't go back to Rise of Skywalker. I just couldn't do it. And then I watched The Boys. And then I've been watching a lot of The Amazing World of Gumball. And I watched one season of Reacher, the first season of Reacher. And then I think that was it. And then I watched some movies or two movies for our Aliens series. That's some watching. That was a busy yeah, Fourth of July week. <laughs> it was. Oh, and I watched the season three of The Bear. <laughs> <laughs> where do we want? Where do you want to start? Where should we? Let's, the, let's talk about Sahara. Have you seen that movie? I, I love that movie. Oh my gosh! I I love Steve Zahn. Like, I, how come he's not in more things? Like, I saw him in The White Lotus. He, I didn't even realize he was in the Planet of the Apes movie. Then he's in this, and he's just like, he's such a great, fun-loving character. And I think why I love Sahara so much is that it captures this, like, perfect mid-budget adventure movie that is fun and engaging, but also not overly serious and isn't mired in sequels and prequels. Yeah, for anyone not familiar with this film, it came out 2005. Directed by Breck Eisner. What a name. What a name. He pretty much did this. And he did The Last Witch Hunter in 2015. The Crazies 2010. Thought Crimes 2003. Not a lot, honestly. Yeah, like I don't even know what those other things are. Nope. So here's the deal. This movie was not a box office success. On a budget of $160 million, it only grossed back 119.2 and crit critics gave it like a 41 out of 100 they called it preposterous and bland and mind-numbing and yet today i'm like if this came out today this would be a huge hit it would be yeah because it's, it's streaming so more box different. office yeah it's just so different from what we're getting in the theaters now that like i think a fun kind of mid-budget thing starring someone that you know and like and is just like a fun little adventure. A standalone little adventure is like so refreshing at this point. Yeah, there is one little piece of controversy that I do love about it. There are documents that were leaked in 2007, I want to say, or the LA Times wrote about it in 2007 that stated that some of the item lines in the budget were actually bribes to the Moroccan government. Which is fun, because I'm like, there's a legal way to do this. <laughs> there, there's tax credits. There's all kinds of things you can do to bring in money. Why does it have to be a bribe as a line item? Anyways, funny to me. That's funny. But yeah, Steve Zahn, so lovable. Matthew McConaughey, so lovable. Being a kid of the 90s, I think, I, I know I saw this in theaters. This was one of the first movies I was like, this guy's just great. You know, so great, so lovable. It's a fun one. I'm not sure it passes the Bechtel test, right? Like Penelope Cruz, I don't think, I really don't know what what service she has to the plot other than looking nice and like being a, being a damsel that, that Dirk Pitt, Matthew McConaughey's character, can can save. You know, but she's, she's nice to look at in the movie. And, you know, I, when I was watching it again, I was like, this kind of like feels like, like a James Bond mixed, like an American James Bond. Where whereas James Bond is this refined, regal, high-minded British guy who does these secret missions, Dirk Pitt is like this American treasure hunter who's rough around the edges and he's funny and 
but he's really single minded, but he's also a gentleman and he's going to save you, but he's going to do it with his shirt off and, and he's going to come out of the water glistening because he was spear fishing. And then he's going to use the spear gun to save you. And then he's going to, in his selfish pursuit, actually save the world on accident. And I'm just like, this is the American version of James Bond. So almost like Indiana Jones. Yeah. If you were to mix Indiana Jones with James Bond, like I feel like that's Dirk Pitt. Yeah, I think Indiana Jones, James Bond, and then I, we have to talk about another movie that it based itself on, even though it is based on a book. But another movie that kept close was, this to me was like a more cool punk rock national treasure. Yes. Whereas Nicolas Cage is Shakespearean and operatic and so serious. It was like, <laughs> McConaughey's like, all right, I'm going to pop another beer up and then we're going to go find some treasure. You know, it's very different. But also, can we talk about an actor that I hadn't put together was in this film, Rain Wilson. Yeah. Rain Wilson's in Sahara. Once he exploded with Dwight Schrute, he was yeah. just a typecast as that kind of guy. And he wasn't really Dwight Schrute in this. Like, no. I, you know, I'd be interested to see what the timeline was, but he, you know, he was the bumbling nerd character who was doing science and stuff, but they gave him like some wins and some cool action things. And, you know, he did, a, he did, you know, in a script that had Matthew McConaughey and Steve Zahn being funny and charming, he was also funny and charming. Yeah. I know he always complains and you'll hear it. If you listen to his soul boom podcast or otherwise not complains, but he bemoans the fact that none of his movies have ever done well. And they're very similar to other famous or well-beloved movies. It's just like, is he the common factor? And I feel like this is one of them. I'm like, this should have been a bigger hit. And yeah. I own the DVD. I love this movie. I watched it so many times. This was like a good comfort flick when, yeah, homesick or like a summertime movie. You just don't get better than treasure hunters in the Sahara finding a Confederate submarine warship. (laughs) (laughs) All the things put together. (laughs) And using like, you know, an 1800s cannonball to take a helicopter out of the sky like <laughs> oh amazing <laughs> the amount of like things that just have to align and there's a, you know it's really good like really good script writing like i thought mm-hmm. the, the jokes were really good like like especially there at the end when you know they're in the submarine and the helicopter's gunning them down and he's like no it's okay this thing is made out of like an inch and a half thick of like lead or whatever we're totally fine and then yeah. Da, 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 and the entire thing just gets peppered full of holes. And it's like, okay, actually, maybe not. Yeah, it's just, it's a good one. It's a good one. If anyone hasn't seen it, where did you watch it? Did you watch it streaming? Uh, I, yeah, I found it on Amazon. Go watch it on Amazon. It'll make you want to dig into, at least for me, I was a history boy. I was like, ironclad warships. Was this real? Did this happen? Could they have gone that far? I don't think it could have made it over there, but it is still really fun. And... Uh, yeah, not not a bad way to figure out a little bit of history and enjoy Steve Zahn and McConaughey at their best. Let me talk about one that I saw that was unexpected. Yeah. I don't like horror movies. So I went and saw Maxine. I had not huh. seen X or Pearl leading up to it, which I know is a card. Are they related? Movie. They're in a shared world, but you don't have to have seen the other two to watch okay. this one. Okay, so it's not like it's like they're direct sequels of each other. No. So my friend had told me that. He was like, hey, I love the other two. We should go see this together because it's not directly related, but there'll be some like things shared, whatever. It does a really good job of being a standalone film that like throughout gives you little clips from the other movies to be like, oh, I could piece it together. She did this. She did here. There were murders. She's running away. OK, I got it. It's not an amazing movie start to finish, but it is good. I don't love the excessive gore to the level of she uses her heels to step on a guy's balls and they explode and the camera just stays the whole oh. time. And it's oh. like the whole audience collectively made just a, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but it was fun. The audience was engaged the whole time. This was a fun watch in the theaters, other gory moments. We all shrieked in terror, uh, but it wasn't scary. It was like a cool period piece about this adult film star trying to become a real film star some of her past is chasing her down of like some suspected murders go watch x as it directly relates it's all about satanic panic and all those people being scared and attacking the movie industry for like their role in the satanic panic so really relatable to today (laughs) 
Yeah. <laughs> Everyone talking about pedophiles and evil and Satan and like, oh, you're making a movie. You must worship the devil. It's a fun one. Honestly, I enjoyed it. And if you have Stubbs, there's another rewards program. It's just a ticket on a Sunday night. It was quick. It's an hour, 41 minutes. So it's under two hours. And it goes by quick. It's fun. Mia Goth is just insane and crazy and scary. Bobby Cannavale is great. You just have a fantastic supporting cast. How'd Halsey do? Hal- Halsey's fun as her friend. She doesn't have a huge role, but she is the friend. She's good. Elizabeth Debicki is scary good in her role. And she, she again, doesn't have a huge role. Lily Collins doesn't have a huge role. Kevin Bacon is fantastic. Kevin Bacon's in it? Wow. The reinvention of Kevin Bacon is here, baby. And it is <laughs> so good. I don't know if you saw that movie, Leave the World Behind. No, I haven't. Okay, I watched that this weekend, too. He's also in that as, like, a Southern guy. In this one, he is this PI, this personal investigator, private investigator. And he's just gross, and he's got funky prosthetic teeth, and he's got a nasty mustache, and he's just, like, this greasy, gross Hollywood PI. It's really good. Wow. Giancarlo Esposito does a role, and he's completely unlike anything else he does. It's great. It's a great. Maxine. Go see Maxine. Cool. I'm not sure I've seen, what's her, Mia Goth? I don't know if I've seen her in anything. Infinity Pool? She just loves horror. Suspiria? Yeah, I'm, I'm like, I'm just not a, I'm not a horror kind of guy. <laughs> no. <laughs> Let's talk Angels and Demons. All right, Angels and Demons. Did you like these movies? The Da Vinci Code and the Angels and Demons? I do, but I have to admit, after Da Vinci Code, the other two were really forgettable for me. Yeah, I read Da Vinci Code, Angels and Demons, and Inferno. And it, they're fun. They're great books to read. In terms of like historicity, you know, <laughs> you probably know better than I do. They're, it's historical fun. It it's is not historical, historical fact. It's like you're taking some historical bits and you're lining them up in such a way where it's like, yeah, maybe this could be the way things are. I don't know. I actually like... In some ways, I think I like Angels and Demons more than The Da Vinci Code. They're, but I, I really love The Da Vinci Code. But I don't know. I love the Vatican, and I love kind of the high ceremony of popes and cardinals. And I love the high-minded rhetoric of science versus religion, even though like it's a stupid binary that is yeah. like it's just completely unnecessary. But I love the kind of the I love the archetypes of it all. And I'm pretty sure Hans Zimmer did the music for this, and he knocked it out of the park. Yeah. And the like, the whole final scene with the antimatter bomb that Ewan McGregor's character takes up in the helicopter up into the sky, and it blows up in the sky, and you've got like, like a nebula in the sky as he parachuting down, and it's just like it's so good. Did did Ron Howard direct it? Because I know he did Da Vinci Code. Yeah, it is Ron Howard again. Just like that whole thing is just such good direction. That I love it, even though like, oh, the Illuminati was this band of secret scientists and they infiltrated the Vatican, like blah, 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 whatever. Like, yeah, it's probably not real, but just in terms of like movie making and I love Tom Hanks and I love the like you're stitching together. The, oh, let angels guide thee on their lofty quest. And this, the angels are pointing around the Vatican City to like guide you. Like, it's just it's so much fun. It's just fun. It's fun movie making. Have you been to Vatican City? Oh, I wish. This sounds, this sounds like such a douchey <laughs> American thing to say. No, hold on. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what the, I just have to say. These movies do for those places in Europe what National Treasure did for me in D.C. Of It <laughs> paints it in a totally new view. We're like, I was at the Jefferson Memorial, and I'm like, where are the cameras? Where is the map? <laughs> and then going to the Louvre after Da Vinci Code or going to Vatican City after Angels and Demons. All right, where are the secrets? Where are we getting pointed? Where are the aliens? It does just recolor a thousand-year-old plus historical site in a totally new way. And I'll say, for historical fiction, fan fiction, conspiracy grubbing, whatever people want to say... It is a fun way to watch a movie, and it's a fun story. It is. And it makes me, like, feel like we should do a, like, you know, a series on, you know, movies of the Vatican or something. Because it makes me want to watch, like, The Two Popes again. Oh. And it makes me want to watch. Did you ever watch The Young Pope on HBO with Jude Law? I, I watched a few episodes. I didn't watch the Malcolm season, though. 
the Malkovich season was good. Okay. Like, it was really good. And it made me want to watch all of that stuff again, just for the Latin, the Italian, the, you know, the kind of the papal drama, <laughs> which is such a, <laughs> it's such a weird niche, but I, it, it fascinates me so much. All right. We'll have a papal party and maybe a pap- set it. <laughs> we'll a have papal it podcast for- series? The papal <laughs> podcast, and we'll set it around the next Lent or some other, you know, Ash Wednesday. I, yeah, that is a great idea. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested, especially because being there, you just see uh, there's so many weird things, and I think it would be fun to talk about how we portray it in movies, and it's still so secret and also weird. And every Tuesday, the Pope goes out there and talks to people, and you sit in little folding chairs, and this is normal life. So, good job for Angels and Demons, giving us yeah. a little more. Good job, Ron Howard. Well, let's wrap up there for today. We've got another episode of Aliens in America coming. we got a little recap of the boys and the bear. And we've got another interview this week with an Olympian and just in time for the Olympics. So until then, watch good movies and TV. 